my experience as a worker in the university sector as well as as a unionist. My workplace is a lot of my colleagues don't see themselves as workers and that's a big problem because they are. <laughs> I guess I want to talk about a little how these uh, kind of contradictions within this that particular workplace uh, kind of play out in terms of okay thanks in terms of gender especially and so how um, how the pay gap works in my particular workplace as well as how sexism is elaborated in universities and particularly in relation to um, the way gender stereotypes shape how women are treated and valued in that workplace um, and also how the um, more and more uh, numbers of women in universities have shaped the sector. And then I want to flip into how this um, plays out in unionism. Um, and hopefully, I think there are kind of resonances with other uh, white collar work in general. Um, but also I, I felt there was a, actually a, a lot of similarities, surprising similarities to what Sarah was talking about in, um, in terms of how much work people actually give for free. Academia kind of occupies this really uh, paradoxical and strange place um, in the capitalist economy. Uh, or no, although, as I said, not uniquely so. Because on the one hand, it's seen as this kind of space of refuge from capitalism, uh, as a, a space of resistance and of fr free thought, uh, where people can say what they want. Uh, we still negotiate academic freedom clauses in our agreements, although these are very much um, you know, at risk. <laughs> uh, but at the same time as that, they're, they're run like corporations. It's a very neoliberal workplace, uh, run on neoliberal principles. And I mean, one indicator of this is that it's one of the most casualised workplaces uh, that are around. That's kind of a surprise to people, but over 50% of teaching is done by casual staff, people in insecure work. Managerial speak in the workplace and at the bargaining table, there's a, there's a high priority on flexi employer flexibility and on managerial prerogative. So it's, it's a kind of, um, like, like most workplaces, there's this kind of dual discourse going on um, in relation to what we're actually doing there. And um, this double character of the university in fact forms a basis for exploitation of workers within it. And part of the reason for this is that um, academics very much buy into a fantasy of what academic work is as that it's not labour. They do it out of love. They've, it's, it's like this uh, kind of wonderful job. It is a pretty good job but once you have secure work, but that, that's not by any means the, the normal way to, to be in the in that sector at the moment. So there's this identification uh, with the ideal of the intellectual and the teacher, um, which obscures the realities of a master-servant relation within that workplace. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's a kind of fetishised mm -hmm. space, a, um, a mystique of being an academic. That it, like people, even very experienced people within that workplace still have, uh, and that blocks their ability to actually um, act in their own interests in the workplace. So there's that element of it. Uh, but this is where the gender kind of um, aspect comes into it. Uh, this identification with the job, uh, lo love of the job, um, also leads to an absence of boundaries between personal time and work time and, and spaces as well. So. Um, and this becomes a, a workplace norm, that people are, are just going to be working all of the time. Um, there's a lot of pressure, peer pressure, put on each other in that workplace uh, not, to, not to have personal time. <laughs> um, and, you know, lots of bravado about sending emails at, at 11 o'clock at night um, that are for work and expecting people to respond to them. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's quite insane. But that is, that's become the norm. Um, I, I, I play classical guitar. <laughs> so when people in my workplace find that out, they just say to me, well, how do you have time to do that? And it's kind of like, 
wow, so I'm not allowed to have something that's for me in my life. And I mean, the gendered aspect of that, of course, is that um, where do family responsibilities fit in with that? Um, of course, uh, family responsibilities, family, um, the idea of uh, work-life balance is, is get some lip service uh, in that workplace. But um, I mean, people should also <laughs> have uh, work-life balance in terms of political activities they want to engage in, uh, leisure activities. In our agreement, it says we have a 35-hour week. In reality, it's it's more like between 50 and 70 hours. Um, and uh, what that means is that um, work workload formulas uh, models don't actually capture all of the time that it takes to do the work you're expected to do. And research, which is the um, highly valued work in that sector, uh, is what you do in your spare time. And so for women who don't have spare time, uh, it means they get suppressed in terms of their pathways to promotion, etc. What we see here is, so the red is men and the, the blue is women. A is entry level. It's supposed to be you don't have to have a PhD. That's not the case anymore. In terms of interpreting this, um, we see women kind of getting stuck at level B. You get almost parity at level B, so that's about 47% of um, level B, which is lecturer, uh, is uh, women. And you get women kind of getting stuck at that point. And then as you get the higher pay brackets and the kind of more status roles, this here is professor. <laughs> There's 23% of professors are women. This is actually from what HR were willing to give us. Uh, but we don't have stats for professional staff. And that's like this whole other um, work in fact most more there are more professional staff in universities than academics um, and this is very gendered again uh, so the ideal of the academic is male and the ideal what people think of when they think of professional staff is is women um, so I mean by far the, there's a greater proportion of women in professional staff uh, but again um, there's a disproportionate number of men in upper management and women uh, kind of getting stuck in lower classified positions where the work is less interesting uh, and where there's not much opportunity for advancement. Um, so this is kind of the, the I guess, the, the way that gender kind of, I mean, gender stereotypes in ter terms of academic work too uh, so, for instance, I, I saw an interesting study recently of um, teaching evaluations. Um, so, this is students uh, assessing their teachers. Um, and this has a lot of impact on, um, on workers' performance reviews. So, we, we get performance reviewed every year. Um, and essentially, men get an 18% kind of boost in those teaching evaluations. So if you're a man, uh, you're 18% better automatically than a woman teacher. And this, this is exacerbated in large classes. So um, yeah, that's just, that's just pure what students bring in with them uh, as an idea of what a good teacher looks like. Apparently, they have a penis. So, um, <laughs> so that's that's kind of, that actually affects, I mean, universities talk about how oh, these, these don't really mean much, but they do. They absolutely do. Uh, and we see this, I see this in my other aspect of what I do at university, which is in the union. So I'm going to move on to that now. So also what we see in universities, okay, so the, the growth of insecure work in that sector. Um, this, this is both in the academic uh, academic work and in professional work in, in um, the amongst general staff. It's more and more casualised and, and women, again, are more likely to be in that, uh, the casualised, doing casualised work. So it's an increasingly casualised industry uh, with people training for up to a decade in, in the academic work, up for a decade just to, to be um, working in kind of regular but insecure work. 
Um, and, and women are over overrepresented in that uh, insecure work. Um, and this kind of has Im like uh, tie-ins to other, other industries too. So, I mean, across the board, women are more likely to be in insecure work. Um, and, you know, we're seeing real threats at the moment in terms of um, penalty rates being under attack. Uh, that's something that's going to affect women more than <coughs> any other uh, you know, gender. <laughs> we don't have penalty rates in, in our sector, but there, you can see that there are kind of cognates across, across the, the workplace. Um, so moving on to unions, uh, especially I guess the post-accord union. So uh, unions have lost a lot of power over the last uh, few decades. Um, and we also are now seeing an increase of women's presence in unions, both as members and in leadership. Um, and I think those things are connected. Uh, so 52% um, of our members um, are women. And so that's an over-representation in terms of the workplace in general. Um, but 63% of casual members are women. And again, I'm just talking about our membership, which is about 10% of the workforce. Okay, so, and NTU is a strong union. <laughs> so that's just an indication. Um, so, yeah. So between um, 54 and 64, I did a bit of analysis of our cases over the last few years, last night, and between 54 and 64 percent of our cases have been women. So these are people that we represent in the workplace because they're having issues in their workplace, the manager has called a meeting, they're being performance managed or, or they've come to us because they're being bullied um, or a whole range, they're, they're wanting to, um, having trouble getting promotion. There's, there's a whole range of reasons that people come to us. Um, but I mean, one thing that I noticed just from the last couple of years looking at cases is um, at I mean, men, men, when they're being performance managed, tend to be at the end of the line, in a sense. Like, they've been, there's been issues arising for quite a few years, and now they're being performance managed because it's become something that, uh, that is obvious. Whereas we've had cases of women being performance managed. Um, uh, I, I can think of one in particular who is, uh, like, excels across the board. And, and, you know, you have to balance um, research and teaching and, and uh, administration. You have to be excellent at all of them. <laughs> um, if there's any that you're kind of falling down in, you can end up in a meeting with your manager being performance managed, which, you know, the end point of which may be job loss. And, um, yeah, we've, we've had a woman at the moment being um, performance managed for almost two years because she failed to put a, a form in when she took some leave uh, and she was doing work during that, that leave, but um, it's just like she, she became a blip on the radar and now they're just bullying her through that process. So, I mean, you, you get a lot more of that kind of uh, women being focused on for performance in, in my workplace. Um, so union leadership is increasingly uh, women, which is great. Uh, but um, I think this is an indicator, this feminisation of the unions has tracked um, with the gutting of union powers and particularly the right to strike. And you see this in the workplace in terms of, um, so uh, a kind of loss of status of, of union leaders. Uh, so um, my feeling is that um, uh, union leaders are no, no longer seen as powerful people who are going to fix problems. Uh, they're, they're people who um, are providing a service. And uh, the way that I'm spoken to sometimes by some of my colleagues in my capacity as um, a, a union delegate uh, is, is appalling. <laughs> um, and I think that that is gendered, that uh, the, the, um, yeah, the status of, of un unionists uh, is affected by this feminisation of, of the union. It's become uh, yeah, this idea of uh, the union delegate as a service provider. Um, it's, it's, it's become women's work 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, so I guess um, that's something for a broader discussion perhaps. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's great that women have more of a presence in unions, but I also am wary of, of uh, the, the direction of unions in general and, and why it is suddenly that women are allowed that space. I'm a bit cynical about that. Okay, so I'm going to finish there. Thanks. <laughs>